I'll go ahead and get started. Um, you're stuck with me and Abby Kuhn today, but we're excited to be with you at State of the Reserve. My name's Caitlin Dietz, and I'm the Coastal Training Program Coordinator at the GTM Research Reserve. I've been the Coastal Training Coordinator since 2017. And prior to being coordinator, I had the wonderful opportunity to be one of the environmental educators with our education team. And I also served as an oyster intern with our research and stewardship team. Through the coastal training program, Abby and I both have the opportunity to provide the most up to date scientific information and skill building tools like what we're doing today. Um, as trainings and workshops to keep professionals responsible for making some coastal decisions and hopefully some good decisions about our coastal resources. And with that, I would like to introduce Abby Kuhn, who is with me in the coastal training program and is our coastal training program specialist. Abby, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our workshop today. Um, we are really excited that you are here with us and um, we're excited to tell you about some tools that you can use. Um, like Caitlin said, I support her in the coastal training program at the GTM Research Reserve. Um, and I, I like the term that we bridge the gap between the science and the issues that are affecting the coast. Um, so we are really excited to have you here and um, excited to teach you about some tools that you can use. Absolutely, thanks Abby. Um, so I will preface today's workshop with Abby and I are not necessarily experts in the two tools that we'll be sharing about today. Um, we are self-taught users and we have really and en both enjoyed utilizing the two tools that we're going to share about today um, while we're out in the field and I think both personally while we're out and about in Northeast Florida. Um, we'll also be directing you to the resources that both tools provide. Um, so that way, if there's a question that we're not able to answer, or if you are really excited and ready to jump on diving into these two tools, you'll have the, the resources at your fingertips, hopefully. So today we'll quickly go over um, how to use iNaturalist. Abby's gonna go into really great details about that. I'll bop over to how to use EdMaps and then we'll hopefully get some time for questions and answers. Sorry, Abby, I think I stole your slide there. <laughs> um, so a little bit about the GTM Research Reserve. For those of you who, um, if this is your first time coming to a GTM Research Reserve program, welcome. Um, the GTM Research Reserve is one of the 29 national estuarine research reserves around the country. The reserve system was established through the Coastal Zone Management Act, and it encompasses 1.3 million acres of estuaries. At each of the 29 coastal sites, um, there is a focus on stewardship of our coastal resources, research and monitoring for conservation and management, and training and education that brings opportunities to decision makers, students, adults. Um, we call it K through gray educational programming to help learn more about the estuarine system in our coastal community. And each reserve around the country has a federal partner and a state partner. Um, the reserve's federal partner is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And in the state of Florida, um, our state partner is the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And the GTM Research Reserve falls with under, or falls under the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection within DEP. And then we do have a local partner or a local cheerleader in our background, the Friends of the GTM Reserve, who are there to support us in every way that we could imagine and um, help with getting the message out about the reserve. 
And Abby, I will go ahead and pass it on over to you. All right, thank you. We're gonna get kicked off right here. Um, so a lot of you may be asking, what exactly is biodiversity? What does biodiversity really mean? And at the most basic definition, biodiversity just includes every living thing, whether it be plants, bacteria, animals, us humans, um, everything. And um, the GTM Research Reserve's ultimate purpose is to serve as a platform for research that guides um, education and stewardship programs that focus on the conservation of the natural um, natural resources, cultural resources, and the natural biodiversity um, of our local area in Northeast Florida. Um, so today we will discuss some threats to natural biodiversity. That's more in Caitlin's section uh, with EDMAPS, but we will also cover some strategies and tools um, that will help promote and um, will help report some of the natural biodiversity that's um, within GTM Research Reserve's uh, boundaries and also beyond, beyond the boundaries of the reserve. So the tool that I will be talking about is called iNaturalist. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of a background on this platform. So it started as a graduate school project um, with, I think it was a, a California university in 2008. And then in 2014, iNaturalist actually became an, an, an initiative of the California Academy of Sciences. And then in 2017, became a joint initiative between the California Academy and the National Geographic Society. So it's definitely developed into a great platform and I know that they're continuing to add lots of features to it. Um, so it's now considered or has been considered a citizen science project um, and an online social network of um, naturalists, citizen sciences, biologists, basically anyone who has access to it. And um, iNaturalist can actually be accessed from um, multiple platforms. We're gonna discuss three different platforms today, um, but there's also some mobile applications available um, as well. So observation recorded with iNaturalist uh, provide valuable open source data to um, a lot of scientific projects and conservation agency and organizations. Um, and you can explore any observations that have been made in your local area, whether it be um, our local area here in Northeast Florida or um, anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world, really. Um, and I was looking at the website last night and there are over 1.4 million people who have created iNaturalist accounts um, as of yesterday. I updated, updated those numbers yesterday. Um, and over 58 million observations have been made, which is mind boggling. So that's really cool to think about. And then of those, of those observations, um, about three, over 320 million species, different species have been observed. So that's, it's really great to see um, the different, um, the, the range of the biodiversity that people are reporting across the globe. So I am first of all going to ask you to navigate to your participants tab. If you click on that tab, it'll open a menu and give you the option to raise your virtual hand. And I just wanna see, or if you're on camera, I wanna just see, um, raise your virtual hand or your physical hand if you have used iNaturalist before. Awesome. So we have a few veterans who are coming back and we have a few newbies. So this is great. Um, we will, um, it'll be a refresher for some of you that have used it and then it'll also be a new thing, a new tool that you can use. So this slide right here is just a very simplified graphic of how iNaturalist works. So it allows you to record observations or snap a picture of it. Um, you will then upload it to the iNaturalist platform and share it with fellow naturalists and biologists and researchers. And then, um, like I said before, it is a social network um, of all these experts. 
So um, you were able to get um, confirmation from people who may have identified the species before and also just allows you to discuss your findings. Um, so the observation records what you saw, when you saw it, and where you saw it. Um, and also includes evidence that you saw it. So you can, again, upload pictures. You can actually also upload sounds or recordings. If, um, for example, if you hear a bird call, you can up, uh, upload that and record that as an observation. So there are several different things that you can upload um, and record as an observation. So um, iNaturalist is a, an easily accessible platform. Um, you can go to iNaturalist.com or iNaturalist.org, I apologize. Or um, if you have an Android or an Apple phone, you can navigate to the app stores on those um, devices and um, upload the app. And the, the icon for the app looks similar to this green bird icon um, in case you are looking for that. And um, the app is available to be used um, without cell reception or Wi-Fi. Um, your observations will, if you upload them in the field and you don't necessarily have cell service, they will upload as soon as you do have that um, cell phone reception or Wi-Fi. And then a little bit later, I'll discuss uh, a few of the different way or the displays for the, the different um, platforms that you can access iNaturalist on, because it does vary depending on if you're on um, if you're on the platform website on a computer versus the, the mobile app. So if you um, explore, if you start exploring iNaturalist on your computer, this is what your um, page should generally look like through an internet browser. Um, so we have some screenshots here. I've actually, I actually started using iNaturalist only on my phone. So I didn't even, I wasn't even aware that it looked like this online, but um, there are multiple ways. So multiple ways to report observations. So if you decide to use the phone on your camera, um, cause I know some phone cameras have gotten a lot better in recent years. Um, you can do that. Also, if you have a, a professional big lens, fancy camera, um, if, you, if you take pictures of your um, species with that kind of a camera, you will probably be uploading your observations through the internet browser um, when you upload your photos from your memory card from your camera. Um, so you will have to navigate to the website and create an account. But once you create your account and log in, this is what your landing page should look like. So um, for example, if you are logging in um, on the internet browser, you will add your observations using the, um, the circled button right here. And then it'll navigate you to a screen that looks like this, where you can choose your files or um, depending on the folder where your photos are, you can drag them into that. And um, that will upload the pictures from your appropriate folder. Um, so then once your pictures are uploaded, it will pull up an observation uh, form that looks similar to this. So you will um, click on the species name, and when when you do when you click on the species name, it will make suggestions based on the photos that you took, um, either species that look visu visually similar or species that may have been seen may have been seen nearby. Um, depending on your camera settings, the time um, may or may not be um, auto uploaded through the form there. Um, but just review it uh, to confirm. And then if you have a geotag function within your camera or within the, your, um, the, the device you were using for your pictures, 
Um, the, the latitude and longitude coordinate coordinates should also be uploaded. Um, but you can also upload a pin or select a pin there in the, um, oops, in the um, location, op the location box right there. Um, and then I will go into a little further into um, some geo privacy settings here in the next slide. Um, so the observations on iNaturalist have some different uh, geo privacy settings. They can be set to open, um, obscured, or private. Um, it is completely up to you how you would like to report the, the location. It really depends on, um, like if you happen to be in your backyard and you don't necessarily want people to know exactly the pinpointed location of where you live, you might leave it as obscured or private. Um, that This information is completely up to you on what you want to share. Um, Obscured observation only display a specific rectangular, rectangular cell encompassing um, the general area where you're located, um, but it does hide the true exact coordinates for your location. So um, that is up to you. Um, you can see here that the geo privacy is open on this example observation. Um, that really, again, is up to your comfortability with um, when you upload your observations. So here you can actually see that, oops, apologies for that. Um, so here you can see that uh, these identifications, um, this specific observation was identified as a California freshwater shrimp. And you do, you can see if um, the species is labeled as a specific conservation status, you can see that here. Um, and then you can see here, this is just an example of um, the coordinates are obscured and um, you, you don't actually get the specific coordinates. So that just um, also shows you an example of what the different privacy settings can be. So that was just a quick short overview of what it looks like on an inter internet browser. But um, there are um, a few slides here. So this is what the iNaturalist app will look like on an Android phone. These screenshots were taken courtesy of Caitlin because Caitlin has an Android phone. Um, so you can see here that you can add an observation with the the plus button here. Um, and then that should pull up a screen that looks similar to this. And so you can either, uh, if you are in the app and you are making an observation in the field, you can choose to take a photo right then and there. Or if you take uh, the, the photos through um, just your, your normal camera on your phone, um, you can also choose an image from your photo gallery. You also can see here that you have the option to choose a sound or record a sound. Again, if you're in the field and you hear um, a bird call or a bird song and you would like to record that as um, an observation. So let's see here. So then um, a lot of you might be a little concerned um, that you may not know what you are, what specifically what you are observing. I have I do that a lot with my observations. I have no idea what kind of animal it could be or what kind of specific species it could be. Um, the app is really good at knowing or at suge um, suggesting potential species for it. So I think I took a picture um, I think of a pigeon one time down at the Castillo in St. Augustine. And I don't know a lot about birds in general. So um, I clicked on the view suggestions and it just had some options there um, for, uh, so for similar um, observations that um, identified the specific species of the, of the pigeon or of the bird.
And there's also an option down here at the bottom to add to a project. Um, that kind of just depends on your location. There may or may not be some open projects. Um, I know, I think we have a running project within the reserve boundaries. Um, there also may be some FWC, some Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission projects that might be open. And if your, if your observation location falls within one of those project areas, that should um, populate by itself once the observation gets processed. That's what it looks like on an Android device. Um, this, the Apple device looks very similar. Um, again, you have the observation, but the observe button down here in the middle. Um, if you click on me, it gives you a list of every observation that you've made within the app. Um, and then the explore button is really fun. You can see you can search other observations within your local area or within an area you're interested in. Um, so it looks very similar. It works um, similarly um, as the other platforms. Um, again, the, um, your observations can be added to projects. And also there may be some guides depending on your uh, geotagged area. Um, but there may be some guides that can help you identify your observations. So here's what it looks like if you are inputting uh, um, an observation in the, the Apple device. Again, you can, uh, once you upload your pictures, you can see, you can click, what did you see? to either look up a specific species if you happen to know what it is, or you can, um, again, view, view your suggestions. And then again, the location will be tagged um, and you can choose your geo privacy options. Um, and they uh, may or may not be added to projects um, that are based on your observation location. So now that I've gone over the three devices that you can use iNaturalist on, I'd like to take the last few minutes that I have to share some tips and tricks. Um, so our main goal when using iNaturalist is to gather what we call verifiable observations because those observations actually can help um, achieve research grade status. And so what research grade status means is that it can it has been reviewed by one or more naturalists um, who are familiar with the species that you are observing. And it can be used um, in research. Um, you can also explore that on the app. But um, once you, so once you update, once you upload your observation, um, it will probably say needs ID. And then the iNaturalist community is really great um, there probably will be some experts that come on and either um, verify your, your um, species identification um, and then it reaches that research grade status where it can be used in um, a wide, wide array of um, biodiversity research across the world. So what we recommend for um, your iNaturalist observations is taking clear distinguishable photos of the specimen um, that of often includes multiple photos of the same specimen. So here on this slide, you can see we have one close up, we have one a little further back kind of showing a different angle, and then one with a wider view of the full plant itself. It just helps with um, additional um, identification suggestions and helps people confirm your observations. So a few frequently asked questions. Um, so iNaturalist uses your location and your camera um, so that the location and the photographic evidence can be used to help identify your observation and also um, potentially be used in research. Um, iNaturalist does not sell your information or use it in any way. Um, 
And if um, we do recommend you taking multiple pictures. Um, and if you don't know what you saw, if you don't know what you observed um, or aren't sure of the specific species, don't worry. Um, that is 100% okay. Um, if you would like to try guessing just the general family of what it may be, and that is perfectly fine. The iNaturalist community is great about um, supporting you and helping you identify that species um, so that the observation can be, can reach that research grade status. So we encourage you to go ahead and start making observations. Um, download the app if you take pictures with your big cameras, um, uploading them on the internet browser. Um, if you would like some additional training and support, there are um, a lot of other tutorials and helpful videos or helpful um, how-to pages on the iNaturalist website. Um, so if you, after this, this workshop, if you have some more questions, you can navigate to um, the iNaturalist website and see that they have a lot of different tutorials um, and extra tools that can help you use it successfully. Um, so that is all I have and I will pass it over now to Caitlin to talk about some invasive species and a similar app that can be used to track and report those. Great. Thanks so much, Abby. I know I use iNaturalist pretty regularly uh, whenever I go out hiking or walking around. I feel like I'm always pulling out my iNaturalist app to figure out what I'm looking at, especially if it's new and fun and colorful. You always want to know what you're seeing. Um, so as Abby mentioned, I'm going to share about another tool that's utilized um, and a tool that's utilized a lot by land managers in tracking the observations of invasive species. Um, iNaturalist does have um, an identification of invasive species. So if you are tracking or observing something in iNaturalist, sometimes it will trigger that this is an invasive species or this is a non-native species, which is really great. Um, but I'm going to talk about EdMaps, which um, is a second tool that helps track observations of species. And EdMaps stands for Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System. And it helps track the observations of invasive species for land managers for a couple of different reasons. Um, but before we get into that tool, I just wanted to share a little bit about what an invasive species is. Um, I know several of you we've worked with on invasive species removal days. You're part of the first coast invasive working group. Um, but there, there's a lot of really cool thing. Well, cool, but there's a lot of information about invasive species out there. Um, so an invasive species is an introduced non-native organism, um, whether it's a disease, a parasite, plant or animal, and it begins to spread or expand its range from the site that it was in originally introduced. And it has the potential to harm the environment, the economy or human health. And invasive species can include plants and animals. Um, some of the top invasive animals that you might be familiar with are Burmese pythons that are in southern Florida, feral hogs that we do have here at the GTM Research Reserve, Cuban tree frogs that are pretty abundant around northeast Florida, um, tegu lizards, which we, we have seen a few in northeast Florida, um, iguanas and well, there are plenty more, um, but invasive species are not limited to land. There are several aquatic invasive species like lionfish, um, and there are some aquatic invasive plants like water lettuce or feathered mosquito fern. Um, and they, as an aquatic species, you might think, oh, how are they, you know, impacting humans or impacting land, um, they can really disrupt the waterways and our estuaries. And they do outcompete our native species um, because they have 
a lot of characteristics <laughs> that make it easy to outcompete. Um, so an invasive species, or inv we're going to focus on invasive plants for this workshop. Um, but invasive plants thrive because they are tolerant to many different soil types and weather conditions. They like sandy soils. They like nutrient rich soils. They like full sun, full shade, full rain. Um, they grow in, grow everywhere. They also lack natural predators. Uh, so there's no, no way to really balance out the, the species um, and the ecosystem. They reproduce rapidly and can self-propagate. So they don't necessarily have to have a male and female germination. Um, they have allelopathic properties, meaning that the invasive plant produces chemicals um, that inhibit the growth of surrounding plants. There's one in particular called Chinese tallow, and the roots produce chemicals, and you can often see a ring around the Chinese tallow trees where other plants have begun to die off um, and other Chinese tallow plants are popping up. And they're fast growing. Um, one example is kudzu, which I'm from Georgia and kudzu is everywhere in Georgia. Um, and we do have some, some observances of kudzu here in Florida and in St. John's County. Um, but kudzu can grow, it has been um, documented that they can grow one foot per day, especially in the summertime. Um, so they are fast growing and um, when we find invasive plants, we try to hop on them as quickly as possible. And some might think, you know, it's a plant, it's growing, it's green, let it go. Um, but it's a pretty big problem, especially here in Florida. Um, it's important to manage our invasive plants and to help protect our natural resources that we enjoy experiencing, keeping our, our natural Florida. Um, here in the state of Florida, more than 4,000 plant species are, are observed and about 1,300 of those are non-native or exotic, meaning they've been introduced from other states or even other countries. And of those, over 100 of those are quickly spreading throughout natural areas here in the state of Florida. Um, FWC actually estimates that 1.7 million acres of Florida natural areas are being infested with invasive species. And according to the Florida Forest Service, invasive species have actually contributed to the decline of about 42% of endangered and threatened species. Um, and Florida is ranked number two in the United States for invasive species. And any guess in the chat box of what state is number one? Oh, I see it, Hawaii. <laughs> um, so go Florida. <laughs> um, but how did that happen? Um, Florida has many ports and many entry points. Um, and we, we know that living on the coast, most of our state is shoreline. Um, and invasives have been introduced from other regions to solve existing problems. Um, one of those, the trying to solve has been erosion. Um, one invasive species called beach vitex was initially brought over to the US to help solve coastal erosion. And it has quickly become another problem. <laughs> um, plants and animals can also escape their pots or are released when pet owners are no longer able to care for them. Um, so it happens by accident. It happens intentionally. Um, and so it's important for us to, to be mindful of that. Um, there are some other ways that invasive plants are, are carried around across the state. Um, one is by wind. 
we are in a coastal community and there's almost always a breeze. And so wind can transport seeds or um, berries. They can also be moved by waterways. Uh, for example, if there is a Brazilian pepper tree that is overhanging a marsh, um, any of those Brazilian pepper tree berries can drop into the waterway and be moved along to the next landing. Um, animals are another natural mode of transportation. Um, any animal, most likely birds that are eating and digesting these seeds, uh, then eventually have to remove those from their body. And it is nice and fertilized and ready to go and bring up a new plant. Um, something that we are very mindful of at the GTM Research Reserve is equipment. Um, any equipment such as landscaping equipment that moves from property to property um, can transmit and move along our invasive species. And so it's very important to inspect any equipment before it comes to our comes to properties um, to make sure that nothing is being brought over from another site. Um, we'll see this sometimes along the roadways if there is landscaping that's happening along the side of the road and it's just going over an invasive plant. Um, it typically will be then relocated to the next site that that landscaping machinery goes to. Um, something that we can all be more mindful of is when we're out experiencing and exploring our natural communities is keeping an eye on what we're walking through because of clothing and little seeds can stick onto socks and shoes or in the soles of your shoes. Um, so always be sure to check that. And then intentional planting. Um, invasive species have some regulations but are not um, not all invasive species are regulated. And so there are some invasive species that you can purchase in your big box stores. And so we, unless we're, we know that it is invasive species, um, we, we sometimes do plant them. And so Abby and I and a few of a few other folks on the call are part of the First Coast Invasive Working Group, which is a cooperative reed, weed management area. And it was established in December of 2006 to work across federal, state, local, and private lands for invasive species management. And it's one of the many statewide regional partnerships that is helping the state prevent and control invasive species. And the First Coast Invasive Working Group, is um, we focus our resources in the Baker, Clay, Duval, Nassau, and St. John's counties. Um, so we are trying and we share this information with folks like you so that way you can also be our eyes and ears out there. So I'm going to quickly show some of our common offenders so that way you can also help keep an eye out for them and then we'll go into the EdMaps tool. Um, so the purple left is Mexican petunia which might be landscaped in some areas that you see regularly. The middle is Kalinkoe, which is a succulent that is growing crazy in dune systems. Um, and I know several of you, uh, this, is, this is what your main focus is on. <laughs> um, and then on the right is asparagus fern. And then three more repeat offenders. The left is beech vitex. And it's considered the kudzu of the coast because it has that really quick um, growing property, but it grows in our on our dunes. Chinese tallow in the middle. And then I'm sure somebody in the chat box could tell me what the far right pictures are. <laughs> Ah, Kelly, absolutely. Brazilian pepper. <laughs> um, so navigate to your raised hand that you used earlier and raise your hand if you have used Ed Maps before, more than just downloading the app. Awesome, I see Shannon has. So this might be new to some folks. 
Um, so EdMaps is a web-based mapping system for documenting invasive species and pest distribution. It's fast, easy to use. It was launched in 2005 by the Center of Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health at the University of Georgia. And it was originally designed as a tool for the exotic pest plant councils to help get a more complete distribution of invasive species. And since then, it's expanded to the entire US and Canada, and it's helpful to document native species and invasive species. And oh, this tracking system is really great because the data that's shared in this tracking system can help be utilized to identify and help um, manage invasive species and also um, is used whenever groups go um, and try to get invasive species listed as noxious weeds or um, plants that need to be regulated. So we really, really appreciate any tracking that you have helped in this um, app. Like iNaturalist, it is a free uh, tool that you can use and you can create an account online at edmaps.org. And then once you're in there, and I use this more for more than just reporting sightings, I use it for distribution. Um, but you have a menu of options, including reporting sightings, distribution maps, species information, which is really great too if it's a new species to you, um, and tools and training. So for the for the purpose of this workshop, we're just going to walk through what it looks like to report an invasive plant. So you'd first click on report sightings, and then you can choose whatever species you're wanting to report. Um, there are plants, pests, insects, a little bit of everything. And then you'll want to select what state or area you're reporting that occurrence in. Um, so you can utilize this outside of Florida if you're traveling. Um, and there are four main sections that uh, the form will prompt you. Um, the first is about the species. The second is about the location. It'll definitely want you to upload photos like iNaturalist. And then there's a portion to add some additional notes. Um, EdMaps really does want for you to have an idea of what species you're looking at. And so that might be where iNaturalist can help or any of the other invasive species information um, that we can share after this workshop. Um, but you can start typing the name into the invasive species and name box. Um, and you can utilize the, you can use the common name or the scientific name and it'll generate a list and then you can select from there. And then you'll provide some information on the infestation. Did you find the plant there? Did you not find it? And this is also, you know, as land managers, if we have somebody who says, there's Brazilian pepper at this site, we can go out and kind of ground truth that. Um, and then you'll add the observation date. And the date, the default is the date that you entered it. So if you are doing a lot of field days and have a collection, just make sure you adjust it for the date that it was actually observed. You'll add the habitat type. You'll kind of give an estimate about how much space um, the infested area is, try to only include the area containing the invasive species. Um, and then there are some other fields that you'd include, like the gross area or the canopy. Um, and it depends on what plant you're talking about. Um, and uh, there are definitely resources online that can help walk you through that a little bit more. Um, it will ask for your state and county. So keep in mind if you're out traveling where, what county you might be in. Um, and then it will ask for the coordinates and ownership. Um, if this is on a private property, you do have to have permission from the landowner to share the location of the invasive species. Um, and when you do do that, you'll want to notate that it is private. So that way it is hidden from the public and it is only something that land managers have access to. And then it'll ask you to upload images to your report. Similar to iNaturalist, you'll want to have up close images. Um, any key identifications, uh, the leaf structure, 
the leaf pattern. If there are any berries or flowers, try to capture those um, because that will be very helpful um, when a, a confirmation or a, another person is trying to identify what you're looking at. Um, and then also try to scale out to get the size of the infestation or the plant or the tree <laughs> if, it, if, it's, uh, if it's gotten that large. Um, and then try to give a caption of what that main feature is. If you're trying to capture Mexican petunia, say it is a purple or violet flower um, with the amount of petals or shapes. Um, the more information you can provide here, the better for the documentation. And then you're able to submit any additional comments, um, whether it was a wet area, a dry area, um, and then you submit. And then what happens is there are verified accounts or verification accounts throughout the area. And they are likely um, professionals in the invasive species realm who are who receive notification that you have submitted a report and they will be able to go on and verify that the plant that you think that you have identified is truly the plant that you have identified. Um, and then that will help just maintain the observation database and gives uh, land managers the opportunity to also coordinate working days to go out and help remove those invasive plants as they're able to. So that's what we have for EdMaps. It was pretty quick, um, but we hope that after today's workshop, you feel a little bit more comfortable with the two applications to help track species observations. Um, and as you go out and explore our natural areas and utilize these two applications, um, we just want to remind you right now to follow all CDC guidelines and maintain social distancing. Um, be mindful of your surroundings, especially if you are in a traffic high traffic area or where roadways are. Sometimes you can get very into looking at your phone and playing around in the um, applications, but be mindful. Um, and also never pick up or touch an animal or plant, especially if you're not sure what you're trying to identify. Um, and with that, we have a few moments to take any questions. Um, and we can take questions either from the chat box or if you'd like to raise your virtual hand. And Abby has shared the two links for both iNaturalist and EdMaps in the chat box if you'd like to go ahead and start exploring those. All right. Well, Abby and I will stick around for a few more moments. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, like we said earlier, these are two tools that we've really enjoyed using while we've been out and appreciate. Um, Can I raise my real hand? Oh, yeah, absolutely, Vicki. Okay. So one thing. Um, Especially I noticed with with yours, Caitlin, um, like it was like type in the name of the species or whatever, but what if you're looking at something and it, it looks unusual or whatever, but you don't know what it is? Is there a way that you can like look at a bunch of pictures and see if you can identify it in the app or how does that work? Yeah, there, there are a lot of really great resources through several other invasive species um, uh, resources <laughs> uh, online that we can share with you through an email um, after this okay, workshop. Okay, so, 
So this is not one where you could look it up, but you would look it up somewhere else and then you would know what it was and then you would report it. Yeah, yeah. Right. So this is Thanks more for, for if, you have a, if you have a really good idea of what it is. Um, there is some room if, if you do misidentify it. There are some invasive species that unless you're touching them and, you know, sometimes it's smelling them, um, it can be be very challenging to identify. And so that's where the, the verifier can come in and they're the ones that can, they know exactly what to look for and can say, oh, it might not be this, but it's actually this. Um, so there is some room for, for misidentification, uh, but it does, it does more rely on you having a, a little bit more of an idea of what you're looking at. Hey, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, great question. Thank you, Vicki. And I know there was another question I saw in the chat box um, about how long the resources have been available. And Abby shared that iNaturalist was started in 2008 and EdMaps was in 2005. Thank you, Abby, for catching that. So there's a lot of data out there. If you're interested, um, and looking to see how Brazilian pepper, for example, has changed over the years. You can go and you can get a map distribution of Brazilian pepper through um, the state of Florida or through the county. And it's, it's really interesting. Even if you're not out there tracking the invasives, you can get some information about where they are. And I just wanted to add that um, a lot of these, it's just practice makes perfect. Um, I've been, I've had iNaturalist downloaded for several years now, and I still have, for some of the observations that I've made, I, I have no idea what I'm even looking at. So definitely don't be intimidated, but if you don't have any idea what you're looking at, um, there are the, again, the suggestions, um, and also it's just a pretty friendly community on iNaturalist and um, I'm sure EdMaps as well. So there's a lot of support there for you. All right, and with that, Abby, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, so for those of you Alex just made a good point. <laughs> um, and another another reason why, if you don't know what you're touching or observing, don't touch. Um, Chinese tallow trees are also known as popcorn trees. And if you're allergic to latex, you will have an allergic reaction to the plant. Um, same thing with Brazilian pepper. It, um, it can cause skin irritations if you touch the sap of it. Um, and I've also heard if you have an allergy to mangoes, you could have a similar reaction or a, an allergic reaction to the Brazilian pepper as well. Or that's what they make pepper spray out. Oh, is it? I did not know. I don't, that. I mean, that, I don't know if that was true, but somebody told me that. Huh. We will have to look into that. Learning stuff every day. Well, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, this session was being recorded and we will be able to upload it to the stateoftheresearch.org website within the coming months. Um, for those of you who are joining us this evening for our happy hour, we look forward to seeing you then. And if you're joining us tomorrow for the science symposium, we look forward to seeing you there. Um, if you joined here with us today, that means that you found the link successfully, but we did learn earlier today that there were some tech glitches with our, our emails with the Zoom join information going into spam boxes. Um, and so I have, we've sent an email to everyone who registered on how to access the Zoom information by going to the stateoftheresearch.org website. Um, but if you have any difficulty finding that information, please contact either Abby or I and we can get that information to you. And at the end of this week, we'll be sending out a survey 
this is our first virtual State of the Reserve, and we'd love to hear what you think about it. And we are open to any and all feedback and suggestions. So keep an eye on your email for that survey link to come out. And we will see everyone either tonight or tomorrow or the next time that we see you at the Reserve.